Today is Tuesday, October 25th, 2016, and we are interviewing Robert Burns at Valley Haven Retirement Community in Santa Cruz, California. My name is Jean Zarnicki, David Addison is recording, and Julie Richardson will be indexing the finished video. We all work for the Santa Cruz Public Library System, and this interview is being conducted for the Veterans History Project at the Library of Congress. So Robert, let's go ahead and start with you telling us about uh, when and where you were born and your background and what you were doing before you joined the service. Righto. Uh, I was born uh, October 3rd, 1926 in Oakland, California. Uh, my family, where I lived uh, for several years uh, before my family moved to Washington, D.C. in connection with my dad's uh, profession, which was eventually in the academic world uh, as a professor and then dean at the George Washington University. Uh, as a matter of fact, dean on two occasions, once for the School of Government and another for the graduate school there. Uh, I uh, attended public schools in Washington, D.C., uh, graduating from Woodrow Wilson in 1944 at the age of 17 and uh, thereupon joined the Navy, uh, enlisted in the Navy uh, as opposed to being drafted. Uh, from there I went to Bainbridge, Maryland where I undertook boot training and uh, attended quartermaster school, graduating uh, early in 1945. Uh, I had graduated from high school in 44. Uh, and was shipped across the country in a troop train to uh, uh, California to uh, the uh, replacement depot, if you will, uh, out in near Pleasanton, processed through Treasure Island and onto a, a troop ship uh, for the Pacific. We progressed across the Pacific to the Philippines where I was uh, with a large draft of men uh, uh, sent here and there. I spent a bit of time with the Seabees building a, a new facility on one of the small islands in the Leyte Gulf. Uh, but from then we're there uh, was shipped down to Moratai in the Dutch East Indies to pick up my own ship, the LCIR-226, which was a converted amphibious landing craft uh, uh, turned into a rocket ship for use in bombarding coastlines before the arrival of our troops uh, so that the area would be so to speak cleansed of the enemy before they hit the beach. Uh, I served aboard the 226 from uh, late spring early summer until the fall when uh, President Truman made the happy decision, in my case, in the case of all of us involved, uh, to drop the bombs on Nagasaki and Her Hiroshima. We were being prepared for the invasion of the Japanese home islands at the time, uh, having uh, our deck plates reinforced and uh, our uh, radar installed and getting all ready for the uh, unknowns to us, of course. For the, as I said, for the invasion of the Japanese home islands, which happily did not prove to be necessary because of uh, President Truman's decision to drop the atomic bombs. So eventually we uh, traversed back across the Pacific uh, to San Diego, losing an engine in the process and having a layover in Pearl Harbor en route. Um, but we eventually made it to uh, San Diego uh, where we uh, had got a little leave and uh, we eventually uh, decommissioned the ship. I would climbed, climbed up on the uh, <laughs> on the superstructure and took down the commissioning pennant. That was my final act of board and that ship was no longer a part of the U.S. Navy. Uh, like I say, it was an amphibious craft, meaning it was flat-bottomed so that it could hit right on to the beach as opposed to the more conventional form of a ship's hull which is of course sharply concave so that it can cut through the water. Uh, I never had a shot fired at me, I'm happy to say. Uh, our heroes in that war never came back. Those are the true heroes. 
a lot of Marines lost their lives on the islands of the Pacific. Uh, uh, and a lot of Navy personnel too, but the Marines took the brunt of it. Of course, uh, the European war was essentially a Europe, uh, an army war, whereas the Pacific was an amphibious war going from island to island. Uh, uh, the Marines did the uh, heavy lifting in that regard. Uh, I, I, uh, was discharged from the Navy in the summer of 46. Uh, I had taken a, just a semester of college before I had enlisted in the Navy two years earlier. So then I recommenced my uh, college uh, work at George Washington University in Washington, D.C., uh, graduating in 1949, following which I uh, volunteered for a commission in the Naval Intelligence, uh, which I received a little later and uh, was in uh, Naval Intelligence Reserve Officer for 10 years from 1950 to 1960. Uh, I was never called to active duty during that period, I suspect because working for the Department of State as I began to do upon graduation from college in 49 uh, and made a career in the Foreign Service uh, actually, uh, I was probably looked upon as somewhat exempt from being assigned to military uh, duty as opposed to the work I was doing at the Department of State. Uh, I think I've just about summed it up there. <laughs> well, let's back up a little bit. <laughs> and um, were, you, were you able to, to keep in touch with friends and family back home while you were serving? Uh, by letter, yeah. Okay. Yeah. okay. Uh -huh. And did you have any R&R? Uh, &R? Did you? What what you know? What did you do in your your rest time, or were you able to travel anywhere else? No, we. I mean, you'd get weekend liberties, but depending where you were, that was pretty limited. I mean, you were yeah. you were checked out uh, at the close of duty on Fridays and reporting in on the beginning of duties on Monday mornings. So, depending where you were, you, I mean, if you were overseas, it was academic, but. If you were stateside, uh, you were limited in pretty much by mm -hmm. less than 24 hours <laughs> of, of time. So, no, we didn't do anything. I, I, I didn't do anything extensive in that regard. Although I had family here in California that I did visit with while I was uh, uh, awaiting assignment abroad uh, when I was posted out in uh, near Pleasanton at uh, the name of the base uh, uh, escapes me. I should remember it, but I don't. Uh, it was, uh, as a matter of fact, the remnants of it I think are still used as the Santa Rita Jail out there in in, uh, in the county. Um, <laughs> strangely enough, it was a massive base, uh, as you can imagine, for replacement personnel for the entire Pacific. I mean, it had many thousands of personnel processing through there. I was there for a few weeks and visited with my uncle and his family while I was here. Uh, he would pick me up on the weekend and uh, take me to the uh, one of the family uh, residences there in the Oakland Walnut Creek area. Uh, but aside from that, no, I, we didn't, I didn't have any extensive uh, travel. And, and during your training, did, did you have any, you know, special training or...? Yes, I went to, as I said, I went to quartermaster school at Bainbridge, Maryland, following my uh, boot to camp assignment there. Uh, Bainbridge was located at the entry of the uh, Susquehanna River into northern Chesapeake Bay. The winters were pretty tough. Uh, I would say uh, about as tough as you can get in those days. Lots of snow, lots of ice, and uh, I managed to contract uh, acute pharyngitis and was hospitalized for a bit during that period as a consequence. Uh, it, wasn't, <laughs> it wasn't the healthiest spot <laughs> to place a military installation, but in those days people didn't have choice. Uh, 
Uh, I think I have some photos. I don't know if you want to stop the film here. Uh, or no, we can uh, we can add those in the film. Yeah, yeah. All right, I've got. We can talk about them. I've we got can, a photo here of my. Uh, here it is. I. I it's it's described at the bottom. Whatever it is. This one here. Yeah. What's it say there? Hold that. Is that good? Yeah. There okay. we go. Perfect. Can you read what it says? Uh, can you read the print at the bottom? Let me see. Here. Yeah. There we go. Yeah. Well, that's a great. So you're in there somewhere, right? Yeah, yeah. Point I think through. the upper yeah. right hand yeah. side, yeah. middle of the, yeah. of the road. There so, somewhere. quartermaster school. Oh, that's the quartermaster yeah. school. Yeah, U.S. Right. Naval Training Center, okay, Mainbridge, Maryland, yeah. March 19. I'm unfamiliar with what quartermaster school is. Can you explain a little bit? Quartermasters uh, uh, are the <laughs> navigators slash communicators, record keepers. Uh, of the uh, ships that they are assigned to. Um, they serve uh, mostly the officer personnel who are at the bridge of, of uh, ships. Okay. Uh, they, in those days we, we were part of what they called right arm rates. Right arm rates dealt with the personnel who, uh, who whose jobs were if on the deck or above, so to speak. Left arm rates were the those who served beneath the decks, like electricians, engineers, uh, etc. The uh, that was the differentiation between right arm and left arm rates. I just learned here, just within the past week, that the Navy is being reorganized and they're going to do away with that differentiation, then they won't, they won't make it anymore. But that's the way the old Navy was organized. Uh -huh. Anyway, there we go. So shoot me with questions if you so like. Well, t tell us about the specific duties that were involved when you were serving. Specific duties. Uh, perhaps the most important duty I had was keeping the ship's log which uh, dealt with how a 24-hour period uh, was uh, proceeded during a board ship, uh, what occurred of any significance during that period of time, when it occurred, as briefly as possible describing what it was that occurred. It's the history of the ship, the ship's log. Uh, and then, in addition, you you assisted in the, the maintaining and ob obtaining uh, maps uh, that the uh, commanding officer or his assistants uh, could might need in the course of charting the co the course of the ship, uh, where it was going and when and under what circumstances. Uh, in addition, we were to, supposed to also have a capability to communicate, which is ordinarily the signalman's job, but we were there to participate as required or needed. Uh, that pretty well sums up the quartermaster job. And when, when you were returning, when you returned home, how, how was it readjusting back to civilian life? Uh, I didn't have much time to adjust because I it wasn't long thereafter that I returned to college. Uh, my dad, as I think I mentioned earlier, was an academic. He was a professor of economics and then a dean uh, twice over uh, at the university, at George Washington University in Washington, D.C. Uh, so there was not a lot of time <laughs> to play around, unquote, so to speak. Um, I pretty well returned to my to studies uh, uh, following my uh, uh, release from the Navy, which was for I was the, I was in the Navy for roughly two years, from the summer of '44 until the summer of. 
46. And um, what about your medals? What did you did you receive any medals? Well, not having been shot at, uh, <laughs> I uh, didn't have any stars on my ribbons, but I did achieve a few ribbons. Uh, uh, matter of fact, there's a photo over there of me as a little boy taken in a uh, in a uh, sailor suit and then oh, one taken as nice. a commissioned officer. Uh, yeah, really I, don't, I don't know if that's of <laughs> interest, to, interest to you or not. Yeah, of course. That was sent me uh, by uh, a friend who... I'm a member of uh, several veterans organizations here, the American Legion, the uh, Veterans of Foreign Wars, and also the uh, Military Officers Association local chapter, and one of the members thereof uh, did up that little card uh, of mine. Uh, I don't know what else there is you might be interested in. I'm curious about what you studied in college and what qualified you to be an intelligence officer. What were they looking for? Uh, they were looking for college graduates who had uh, taken courses that might be germane to doing intelligence work. Uh, in my case, I was an econ major with uh, minors, if you will, in history and political science. Uh, and entered the department shortly after graduating in, uh, from college in 49 and uh, retired from the, uh, the first of the 31st, I guess, it was the, of January 1946. Not 46, sorry, 76. Uh, so you, this was the Cold War era? Well, right? oh, that was, I'm, I'm sorry, I'm mixing up my Foreign Service career <laughs> with my Navy career. Uh, the Navy commission I held uh, from 50 to 60. Uh, Ended up at, with at the exalted rank of uh, Lieutenant Junior Grade. <laughs> uh, so, it's, so when you went to college, did you know that you were going to re-enlist and go back in as an officer? Oh, I was was all, uh, when I returned to college, uh, the last thought in my mind was having anything to do with the Navy. Uh, <laughs> I had had, uh, I'd had a sufficient. Uh, fulfillment of my Navy interests uh, at that point. But uh, later on I said to myself, wait a minute. I, and I think it was also because of an acquaintance of mine who said, uh, why don't you join the Naval Reserve and get a commission? They're looking for qualified officers to be in the reserve. And I said, well, maybe I will. So I, that's what I ended up doing. Mm -hmm. But I always, I always sort of had navy blue in my blood. I, as a little boy, I can remember sitting up in the Oakland Hills, looking down on San Francisco Bay. In those years, this was the late late twenties, early thirties. Uh, the entire Pacific Fleet would come into San Francisco Bay. In those days, the fleet was not the size it is today, obviously. Uh, and have a rendezvous, if you will. Uh, and at night, they would be all lit up, and uh, during the day, they'd have their banners flying. It was quite a sight to look down upon. Uh, uh, and I can remember my, my family taking me out to uh, a tour of... Uh, at least one of the ships, I don't know which one it was or what type it was, but I was so impressed being a little guy that I was then, uh, just a few years old. Uh, that impression stuck with me my entire life, I think. Uh, probably instilled a little bit of navy blue blood in me. I don't know uh, mm -hmm. if that's the case or not, but could well be. Mm -hmm. Uh, so we, please uh, shoot me with questions. Well, yeah. the, I, I want to hear more about the, the area where you served and, and you know, the uh, climate. And, uh, and all right, uh, the Philippines was right, Philippines. was basically it, although I did have that uh, trip down to Morotai in the Dutch East Indies to pick up my own ship uh, eventually, as I said. 
the Philippines, uh, when we were there, were very hot, very wet, uncomfortable. Uh, spent most of the time in the Leyte Gulf, uh, some of which was on small little islands, Tubabao, Manakani, uh, one of which was where the uh, CBs were creating a new facility that I worked with uh, uh, as part of the workforce there. Um, the one thing I have to say about the CBs is if they didn't have something, they made it or traded for it or stole it or did something to, to bring it to be. Uh, they were uh, quite a crowd of guys. They were all professional tradesmen, not all, but mostly carpenters, plumbers, electricians, what have you, that the Navy uh, brought into service. Uh, and the work they did in creating facilities in the middle of nowhere in these, on these Pacific Islands was just uh, extraordinary to see. It. That's an understatement. Uh, I mean, they would go into a, essentially a jungle and create a facility. It was just uh, you know, fabulous. And being assigned to them, they becoming one of them was a real treat because <laughs> through that arrangement, you uh, there were niceties of life, if you want to put them that way, <laughs> that the others didn't enjoy because uh, they didn't have the wherewithal the CBs had to either create or in some form uh, obtain uh, these f uh, features of life. Uh, it made quite a big difference, quite a big difference. Anyway, so be it. And, and you know, what was, what was the living situation like? Where oh, they had, uh, when I was with the Seabees, it was very pleasant. Uh, uh, we, had, we lived in Quonset huts as opposed to the tents we lived in to begin with. We didn't have to muck around in the mud and sludge uh, that uh, most personnel did. Uh, not the CVs, though. We had dry, clean quarters and uh, good messing facilities. Uh, we even had, uh, I think we even had uh, screens on the, on the sides of the buildings to keep the bugs out. I mean, my God, that was a luxury, <laughs> believe me. I mean, uh, those were the kinds of things that the poor army fellows who were assigned in the general same area, they didn't have those luxuries of life that we did, for sure. The CVs were a very special group. I was only with them a matter of weeks, not months, but uh, uh, I, uh, I'll never forget the experience. And CV. <laughs> so when you say CB, construction battalion. Okay. Oh, I'm sorry. All right. I just want to make sure. Did you work alongside <laughs> them? Were you working on the project? I worked in a cement plant where the bags of cement weighed as much as I did. I swear, I don't know how I handled it, but I did. <laughs> and they had me working in a lumber yard. But here you had always had a mate to help you carry the lumber, so that was not as as uh, onerous a chore, but uh, yeah, they put you to work. You didn't just stand around uh, looking at the sky, believe me, they, <laughs> they, they worked you, but, uh, but they also provided you with good facilities. I mean, that was, I, that's what I tried to emphasize before in my remarks, that uh, their mode of living was quite different from the run-of-the-mill Navy types, uh, which I was part of before and after being assigned to them. Uh, we were, I was a, one of many in, in, in a draft of men who were plucked in pieces uh, for this job and that job, awaiting our permanent assignments, which I didn't receive until I went down to Moratai to pick up my own ship, uh, the 226. Uh, which had just returned from an operation in Balakpapan in the Dutch East Indies, uh, which was a major uh, petroleum installation that the Japanese had taken from the Dutch and which eventually we retook from the Japanese, of course. Uh, the South Pacific was uniquely a theater of its own. 
quite a contrast with the European theater, of course. I don't know what else to cover. <laughs> mm -hmm. We're just trying to get a picture of life there. Yeah. Do you have any other questions on it? Oh, oh it? So we're good on time. All right. Yeah. So, um, uh, how how did your how did your service affect your life? Oh, I would say it probably left an in indelible mark on my bloodstream. <laughs> uh, I've always had an affinity for the Navy, as I tried to describe to you when I was just a little tyke. I mean, that experience of looking down on the, on the, on the fleet uh, anchored in San Francisco Bay back in the late 20s, early 30s. I think my own theory, it's just a theory of course, is that that instilled in something in my psyche that never really left. I don't know how else to explain it. Well, do you have any advice for any, uh, any anybody else that would join the service? Oh well, of course. To me, the Navy's the best. <laughs> <laughs> the Navy's up here, and the rest of them are down here. Okay. That's, that's <laughs> I uh, during my foreign service career, I uh, served uh, a few assignments as political advisor at uh, U.S. military commands. Uh, once initially in France, and later in Germany, uh, and. Uh, there I would mix with a variety of, of course, different military types of person, uh, different military personnel of all services. Uh, so I got a pretty good inkling of, uh, of all services. And so I think I got a pretty good appreciation of uh, the U.S. military and how it operates. And uh, it's... Uh, it's pluses and minuses, let's put it that mm -hmm. way. Okay. I had uh, my foreign service, which is not of interest, I guess, to you. I don't want to take up your time with Actually, that. Actually, no. I'm very oh. interested yeah. in it. Yeah. I was going to yeah. ask a yeah. question. We do want to hear well, what happened after. I started out yeah. uh, <laughs> as a member of a program that was had just been created at, at the department and not back in 49, uh, uh, an intern program. And they, they solicited uh, candidates from around the country, uh, from universities and colleges around the U.S. Uh, to uh, compete, if you will, for a couple of dozen slots uh, in this intern program. Uh, and I was fortunate enough to be selected to, to be one of them. Uh, so for a year we served varying uh, uh, training assignments which we created for ourselves. We, nobody did it for us. We had to go out and find our own slots. So I, uh, I, I knew little or nothing about the Near East, uh, which intrigued me. And so I ended up uh, spending a lot of time in the Bureau of Near East, South Asian and African Affairs in my first uh, portion of my assignment period for, of that uh, that academic year, if you will, that they uh, accorded us. Uh, and then from there I started out a career with first with five years on the Palestine desk, hmm. uh, which uh, in that era, 1950 to 55, was a pretty active one, as you could imagine, in that uh, area of the world. Uh, and remains so to this very day, of course, for different reasons. Uh, following that, I uh, served three years in the office of the, of the Secretary of State, Secretary Dulles, uh, as his outer, part of his outer office staff, if you will, traveled with him to various international conferences, uh, which uh, were extremely illuminating for me and, and great experiences. Uh, following that, I had an assignment to Jerusalem, uh, to the Consulate General there, where unfortunately shortly after arrival, 
one of our, at that time, two sons contracted polio and uh, the family had to be evacuated back to Washington where I, re but I remained for several months until I could be replaced. So then commenced a career in uh, mutual security coordination uh, in the department, uh, which was essentially meant the trying to put together all the pieces of our military and economic uh, aid programs abroad. Uh, which in those years were uh, extremely critical and important for us uh, in trying to settle the world down after the conflagration of World War II. Uh, I need not go into detail. I'm sure you all are well aware of what, uh, what that involved. Uh, following that, I was uh, selected to be part of a state defense exchange program where foreign service officers and military officers exchanged, well, they didn't exchange billets per se, but they exchanged assignments to the Pentagon and to the Department of State to sort of uh, integrate, if you will, and uh, bring more sensibility to uh, the uh, intricate workings between the two departments in terms of the maintenance and furtherance of our security around the world. Uh, Following that, I was assigned as Assistant Political Advisor at U.S. Europe, European Command, located outside Paris for a few years, and then uh, at, to the Embassy in Paris proper, where I was a political officer, political military officer, dealing with uh, the intricacies of U.S.-French relations as they applied to the tremendous uh, logistical backup which we had established throughout France uh, in the event we had a conflagration with the Soviets. And at that, in that era, as you all will, uh, can imagine, we, uh, the Cold War was well underway and continued throughout that period. Uh, following that, I was assigned as the first political advisor to the commander of U.S. Air, Air Forces in Europe in Wiesbaden, uh, which was a illuminating and uh, very pleasant assignment, I must say. Uh, uh, gained great esteem for and, and recognition of the roles the U.S. Air Force played during that period in Europe. Uh, following that, I went back to Washington. I was assigned back to Washington to uh, NATO affairs uh, for a few years, and then to the senior seminar, which was for uh, officers' uh, education, uh, for for their a better basic basic for them to work from as they moved along in the foreign service, which was a fabulous year, really an academic year, filled with uh, wonderful experiences, uh, exposure to the leaders of our land, both civilian and military, uh, and commercial too, uh, pure people who had made their marks on our society in the arts and letters. It was a, uh, a remarkable year uh, that uh, I certainly benefited greatly from uh, as a person. Uh, following that, I was assigned as a political counselor at The Hague in the Netherlands, uh, and then ended my career as an assignment as political counselor at uh, Wellington, New Zealand at our embassy there, and then resigned, retired I should say. Mm -hmm. uh, um, I figured at that juncture my family had gone through enough. Well, that's that's what I was going to ask. Yeah. Question about family. If you had a family during that time, how did yeah. you travel around the world and have yeah. your family we had come four, with you? Or did we they? had four four children, four wow. wonderful, wonderful children who uh, I like to think benefited greatly from their experiences. There are pluses and minuses to everything in life. Uh, mm -hmm. Nothing is on the all on the up or all on the down, and and they had their. Uh, they had their share of both, but I think overall they they benefited. They really did, and uh, I am here now today, uh, living amongst three of the four of them. The fourth one lives most of the time in Singapore with his wife, but he's been here during this period of difficulty of mine, uh, 
where I was stricken by these odd bug bugs that decided to reside in my body and so here I am. <laughs> so I don't know. I, I don't know how more quickly or concisely to. Well, I'm really glad you included your, your <laughs> service overseas. That was amazing. Yeah, yeah that's very much pertinent and important. And um, yeah. we're glad that you shared that. That sounds amazing. Uh, you were all so over the much. place. And I was curious how, you know, being in the Navy and you know for World War II compares to the experience of traveling abroad and how that influenced your perspective on our country and our military and what that means. And, and well, that was a loaded you know? question. Uh, yeah. Well, I think I think it expanded it tremendously. I think uh, it was a. Uh, uh, a, a critical foundation, if you will, because uh, as I said to the people who interviewed me before I was selected to be a part of that intern program at the department, the war really opened up this little guy that I was uh, to the fact that uh, the world around us uh, is filled with controversy and uh, uh, issues that uh, divide and conquer people uh, uh, and we were living in part of that world we were having to uh, cope with the problems of it and hopefully help contribute to the solution of many problems that existed around the world uh, well what uh, how should I put it uh, Perhaps what it did was uh, expand on the fact that we didn't live in isolation. We lived within a very composite, uh, complicated world. Mm -hmm. uh, and of course, uh, the, the more I, the longer I served at the department and abroad, why, the more those realizations became. <laughs> recognizable. I, I hate to take your time up with uh, No, we're fascinated yeah, yeah, by all of it. No, no, no. <laughs> questions, but they are maybe a little bit, some of them outside of the scope of the, yeah, yeah. Uh, of the interview, but yeah. I'd love to see you write a book. Have you ever yeah. written anything about your No, I haven't. I haven't. I, uh, I've written a lot, but it's always been... Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Workmanship. Yeah. And then the pictures. Did we want to show any more pictures? Yeah, did Do you have yeah. any pictures oh, that you want to show? Uh, well, let's see. They that. might I spark that some, great, some yeah. memories as well. I think that'd be great if we want to include that in the video. <laughs> My first two decades. Well, now you got the picture of the. Uh, Mm -hmm. Quartermaster class. Well, now I don't know. There, I should I should let you thumb through here. There, I was a cadet in high school, so there's a one or two pictures of me as a cadet. Uh, but uh, and here are some with the crew aboard the ship in the Philippines. Uh, I don't know if I had. Oh, and here are some when we returned to San Diego where we eventually decommissioned the ship. <laughs> the St. James Tavern. Well, now, okay. All right, there's a goodly batch of the crew there. <laughs> and here. I am with my aunt and uncle and uh, a young lady who was their babysitter and they arranged for me to, for me to have a date with at the Claremont Hotel. <laughs> and Russ Morgan was playing at that evening and he his wonderful, wonderful music. Uh, here's this was taken in Washington with uh, a young lady that I was dating at the time uh, after I, we returned. Uh, I, was and I was assigned to Anacostia briefly before I 
<laughs> There's some more of the crew. Uh, we were in San Diego before we decommissioned the ship. The Pirate's Cave. <laughs> <laughs> Well, the rest of these I don't think would be of much interest to you. Okay. Oh, I don't know. Okay. Yeah. Well, is there anything that is there anything that you forgot to tell us that you need to add? <laughs> <laughs> oh, golly, that's a loaded question. Because uh, you almost left out some very important <laughs> things. So let's make sure we're not holding back. Uh, I don't think so. Uh, Were any of your children military? Did they uh, no, uh, none of them were so inclined. Uh, the oldest, Chip, who was uh, born in 55, was on the edge of uh, the draft, uh, but never got conked by it. Uh, the rest of them were younger, and of course, were beyond the age where they were susceptible to the Vietnam era draft, uh, but none of them, no, none of them were were inclined to, to go into the military. Uh, and of course, as you all, well, I'm dribbling on here. I don't know if you want to waste okay. film. Okay. That's okay. Uh, as you all are aware, your generation is aware. Uh, uh, Vietnam had a tremendous psychological impact on this nation, uh, a negative one, unfortunately. Uh, it, uh, it soured a large proportion of the young generation, the youngest portion of our generation, toward the military. And the poor souls who got uh, enveloped in the war, many of whom, of course, were, we had the draft in effect in those days, as you'll recall, uh, entered not of their own volition, but because they were required to, uh, came back to a, a very negative reception amongst, the, amongst our society which uh, is, is a very sad aspect of our history. Uh, since we moved over here from uh, Santa Clara Valley some almost 20 years ago to our home in western Santa Cruz, uh, I, I've become more and more involved in veterans' activities here. American Legion, Veterans of Foreign Wars, uh, Military Officers Association of America, and uh, the bulk of the members of which uh, I have a high regard for and admiration for. Uh, we've treated our military in recent years very badly, I think. Uh, the ordinary bloke in our nation has a great debt of gratitude to pay to the, these individuals and it's starting to be recognized finally but it's taken a long time uh, with that i think i'll terminate my comments okay well, thank you so much for sharing with us and it was, it was really great to hear all your details. Well, I'm, yeah, I.